Hey everyone, welcome to the Heritage of Sport, an overview of the University of Denver Amachi Project. In this presentation, we're going to be talking about how archaeological methods are used to understand the role of sports at Amachi and give an overview of the type of work that the University of Denver Amachi Project has been conducting. We'd like to start by introducing ourselves. I'm April Camp Whitaker. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New Mexico. I began working with Dr. Clark in 2008 when I was studying at the University of Denver. I've continued working on the project, moving up through the ranks from crew chief to co-field director, and recently completed my PhD at Arizona State University, looking at the development of social networks and community at Amache. And my name is Dr. Bonnie Clark, and I am a professor in the uh, anthropology department at the University of Denver, and I lead the DU Amachi project, um, where I've had the honor of overseeing a dozen or so uh, master's students, uh, just like April, who've done amazing work at Amachi, and I'd like to recognize all of them and the work that they did um, to contribute to uh, this topic. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about the archeology span of sport at the Grenada Relocation Center National Historic Landmark, which is the official uh, title of the uh, site as it's recognized by the National Park Service, uh, but it is most often known by its nickname, Amachi. And as you can, Amachi is the blue star with the circle around it on this picture. And um, maybe you can see that it's in a part of uh, Colorado that is actually almost Kansas. So it's only 13 miles from the Kansas border. It is on the High Plains. Uh, what this uh, map also shows you is its relationship to the other uh, starred sites, which are the other War Relocation Authority uh, confinement centers, as well as then the assembly centers where people were first moved to um, after the signing of the executive order and the movement out of the, uh, the removal zone, which you see the exclusion zone um, there on this map as well. Uh, uh, Amachi is the smallest of those 10 main uh, war relocation authority camps. Uh, its maximum population never topped 8,000, but over 10,000 people were confined for at least part of World War II um, there. Like the other incarceration centers, Amachi was essentially a city behind barbed wire. So rows of barracks provided rudimentary housing and, communal, and there were also communal facilities for eating and bathing. A central area within the camp um, provided community services like the community co-op store. You can see a picture of that here, as well as the high school, which is also pictured here. Uh, Amachian staffed the fire and police departments and the fields surrounding the center um, were used to grow produce and also to raise cattle for um, the incarcerates to eat. Uh, the War Relocation Authority, which again was the government agency running Amachi, oversaw the coordination of most services, but incarcerates staffed most of the positions and Amachians had the ability to make some decisions about the types of services that were offered. Uh, internees organized their own community events and worked to create social structure that resembled the communities from which they had been forcibly removed. Classes uh, on a range of subjects from language to arts and crafts were taught, um, holidays were celebrated, and community festivals were held. Uh, the Amachi Center was unique in its proximity to the nearby town of Grenada, which was only two miles away. And in fact, it was close enough that the Amachi sports teams used the Grenada High School gymnasium and fields uh, for games before the Amachi facilities were built. So I became interested in Amachi after reading a 2003 uh, report on a reconnaissance survey of the site that talked about what amazing physical integrity it has. And um, there's a multitude of remains on the site, such as uh, uh, intact building foundations, which are the concrete you see here, as well as landscaping features that are near them, which you also see. Um, this is, in fact, um, an amazing set of stairs that was, uh, and other landscaping that was built outside of the Boy Scout headquarter building, which was in a rec hall at Amachi. So in 2005, I began consultation with survivors, descendants, and the local Grenada community uh, to uh, look into the feasibility of establishing a long-term collaborative project to research, interpret, and preserve the site. Uh, we uh, 
started that work in 2005 and then it built to an archaeological field school at the site and an associated museum in Grenada. Um, and we held our first field season in 2008 with a crew of just four students, two volunteers, and two graduate students, uh, including April. Uh, since then, uh, we have held a biannual field school that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, it runs for five weeks from mid-June to mid-July, and the program engages a mix of college students, high school interns, and community partners, and you can see them all here goofing around at the Amachi Museum. And together we learn to uh, preserve and learn about the history of Amashi and Japanese incarceration while also learning archaeological um, skills and methods and those in the, at the museum. So the field school teaches two primary archaeological methods, uh, pedestrian survey, uh, which you can see on the left here, and excavation seen on the right. Um, each one of these different techniques uh, provides different types of data on life at Amashi and are important skills for students to learn. Uh, we augment the survey and excavation with a range of other types of analyses, such as the learning how to uh, analyze artifacts. Um, and these uh, clarify what we are finding and provide additional data. A central goal of all archeological field schools is to teach um, the public and future uh, professionals the logic of archeological decision-making and the broad range of skills um, needed to be an archaeologist. And doing this at Amachi means that we can, students can be learning these skills while also doing work at this very important uh, site of heritage. So students um, and volunteers from the field school, uh, after working in the field in the morning, we end our days working um, at the Amachi Preservation Society or APS Museum um, in the town of Grenada. And there, um, the field school crews document and care for collections that have been donated um, to the museum. And this allows uh, our crews to blend their knowledge of the site that they've learned doing archeology span with that that they've learned um, in the archives and to take their labor and be able to thing do things like um, protect those valuable uh, collections uh, to um, develop new exhibits and also share what they've learned with uh, visitors to the museum during the five weeks um, that we are in the field. Uh, to date, in the six field seasons that we've held, we have surveyed 20 residential or barracks blocks that you can see here on this map, uh, four that were used for um, public uh, or community functions, and two blocks that were used primarily for trash disposal. Um, we've excavated 14 features. Um, most of them have been landscape um, improvements. Um, and we've also worked in areas of the site to that uh, we've cleared in advance of site improvements. And so many of those areas were actually chosen because of graduate student research goals um, and our overarching goals for the project um, which are our three main um, foci, uh, the daily life of incarcerees, uh, placemaking or the way that people uh, claim space and make it their own, um, in their individually or as communities, and also heritage as a process that involves different um, ranges of the community. Uh, to answer uh, uh, specific um, I, questions within those foci, uh, we draw on data from archaeology, from archival research, and from community collaboration. And we combine all three elements to help us answer our research questions and enhance our understanding of life at Amachi. And each one contributes in really wonderful synergistic ways to the interpretation of the history um, and to guides the archaeological work and interpretive work. In this presentation, we're going to discuss each of these elements and how they better um, help us better understand the role of sports at Amachi and the way that incarcerates invested um, in their community to make sports possible. So sports have a long history within the Japanese American community and were a way of connecting generations and of creating community bonds. Communities across the West Coast had both formal and informal sports teams that played against each other which connected residents of the same community and developed ties between neighboring towns as different sports teams played against each other. The forced removal of Japanese Americans following Executive Order 9066 fractured a lot of those community ties 
as individuals and families were sent to temporary detention centers. Japanese Americans worked to rebuild a sense of community within the confines of the detention centers and then incarceration centers, and sports became one method for maintaining social ties and creating new ones. Some teams, like the Livingston Dodgers pictured here, were actually able to continue playing together following their forced removal, while other teams were formed in the incarceration centers. At Amachi, sports were a really important part of the social life, and they were rapidly organized as people arrived. Soon you see a wide range of sports that are becoming available, including men and women's basketball, softball, baseball, sumo, football, ping pong, and judo, just to name a few. Teams were organized and coached by the internees, and the participation ranged in age and gender, and ended up representing most of the demographic groups living in Amachi. Sports became a venue for social interaction and a source of entertainment, so participation was pretty high. In 1943 alone, the high school boys basketball league had 28 teams with 250 players and held over 150 games. So that's just the high school teams, just one league. So you can see the quantity of people engaging in sports and the number of individual teams and events that were at Amachi. Sports field at Amachi are found across the site. They're in both residential blocks and in public areas. Some of these sports fields were built by the War Relocation Authority and others were constructed by the internee community. Sports were also played at different levels. So we see friends gathering for informal pickup games at fields near where they live. Uh, the Recreation Department and Recreation Association organized leagues um, and then recruited and organized teams for a number of different sports that then played these league games. The high school had teams from most of the main popular sports and they were competing against each other in sort of a high school league. Um, the high school also had team, or the all-star teams were also formed from the best league players. Um, so across Amachi, they formed these composite teams. And then these league all-star teams ended up playing against teams outside of Amachi. So for example, an all-star team from Amachi traveled to the Gila River Incarceration Center in Arizona to play against teams there. So sports teams are forming based on existing friendships through schools and employment and within the residential blocks. So as you meet new people, you start forming new sports teams, but you also are using them to recreate old sports teams, old friendships. And if you look at the names of these teams, you can sometimes see where they're formed. Um, so for example, the Sebpol Ramblerettes are from Sebastopol, California. The Newshawks are a team of players that are affiliated with the newspaper, and the 12 E Kuzus were from Block 12 E. The victory and losses suffered by these teams were often recorded in the sports section of the Grenada Pioneer, which was Amache's internee run newspaper. And so they were read by residents and many of the games were also attended by a large audience. <clears throat> sports fields are one way of understanding how we are collecting and using archeological data to help meet our research goals. So if we think about our three main foci, so daily life, placemaking, and heritage, you can see connections between sports and each of these. So when turnies modified the physical landscape as they created places to play sports through the building of fields and then through continued modification as they were actively playing the sports. Um, here, we don't often think about the physical evidence that is left by these sort of daily repetitive activities, but the simple act of repeatedly following the same informal path can leave a trace in the archeological record and allow us to recreate an activity. So a group of basketball players running and jumping, like those pictured here, ended up compacting surfaces and they also kept the area around the court clear. And this creates an archeological signature, evidence of their game. Sports were also an important part of daily life and provided a diversion and way of connecting people. So we see that many of the sports fields are accessible to residents from several blocks and they were becoming community gathering places where friends could socialize and spectators gather to watch and comment. We can also use a discussion of sport as part of the heritage process. So connecting the existing and continuing legacy of sports to the internment experience shows the resilience of the Japanese American community in the face of injustice and adversity. The familiar activity, sports also became a way of connecting the experience of internment to activities and concepts that visitors to the site or members of the local community can understand and create emotional bond with. While the high school team in Amachi played against other local communities, it was normally on their fields as away games. 
For one game, the Amache High School football team played the Holly team, and Holly is a town in Colorado about 10 minutes, 10 miles away from Amache. This game was unique because it was played as a home game on the field at Amache. The Holly team was undefeated, so many people expected the Amache team to lose, but in the end, they beat the Holly team 7-0. to zero. So this story of an underdog sports victory is a favorite in the museum, and collections like the high school football helmet and trophy help tell that story. As archaeologists studying sports at Amachi and thinking about it as an activity, we need to link the experiences of individuals to the physical remains of the site by combining physical evidence, like these artifacts, archival data, like the photographs in this presentation, with data collected during archaeological survey and excavation. Archival documents, like maps, provide evidence that can support, clarify, and guide our archaeological work. Maps like this one show the locations of different sports fields that were constructed and those that were planned. On the map, you can see a series of fields built in the central part of Amache or kind of downtown areas. These were large public fields and were used by the Amache community for public events. There were also a number of sports fields built in residential blocks, and these were less formal and more likely used by residents and individuals living in that block and neighboring blocks. These maps are only a piece of the data needed to reconstruct where sports fields actually were, since some of the fields were created by incarcerees and not documented by the WRA, and some fields were planned but never actually constructed. For example, many blocks had a basketball hoop installed near the recreation center, but these aren't pictured here. So archeology span can help us find evidence of new fields and also confirm the existence of others. In 2016, we conducted pedestrian survey of block 10F. So on this map, you can see it outlined in red and marked labeled as a sports field. This open block is located in the center of Amachi and directly across the street from the high school. And we know from archival maps and documents that it was used as a sports field. But from historic images, we also know that the block was used for communal festivals, like the annual Obon, and as Amachi's football and baseball alignment. For the Obon, residents of Amachi built a temporary yagura in the center of the field and then actually took it down at the end. The football and baseball fields appear to have had goalposts and backstops typical of most sports fields. Here you can see the sports fields in the foreground with the high school across the street. You can spend hours poring over photographs looking for key details that can tell us where they were taken, identify what activities people in the photographs are doing, and looking at the material objects that you're using, things like clothing or tools, uh, and these help us interpret the archaeological objects that we actually find in the field. So historic images are guiding us both in interpreting archaeological evidence and in helping to identify areas that might be important for further research. In this case, we wanted to understand the use of communal spaces like Amachi's main sports fields. To do this, we conducted a systematic pedestrian survey. Pedestrian survey is exactly what it sounds like. It's a group of people systematically walking over an area and recording what they see. Survey collects broad data about each section of a site. So we use survey data to compare different areas and identify larger patterns of human behaviors and uses of space. To conduct the survey, we walk each residential block and document gardens, artifacts, and any structures built by incarcerees. We place colored pin flags in the ground to mark the location of artifacts. These are objects used or made by people and the location of features. We call features any structures or immovable components of the sites that were created by its residents. So things like gardens and sports fields. For each feature, we carefully take pictures and draw maps so we know exactly what it looked like and what material evidence remains. Artifacts are documented in place so that they remain for the next people to find and for visitors at the site to see familiar objects that tell the story of people living at the site. So for example, a marble in a garden tells the story of children playing in the shade. Each artifact is electronically mapped using satellite data so we know exactly where it was found. The artifact is photographed, measured, and all of its physical characteristics, so things like color and shape, are recorded. This helps us determine how it was used and if it was modified or altered in the course of that use. We hope during survey of Block 10F to identify any material remains of the sports fields. Many of the artifacts recovered had no obvious connection to the block's use as a sports field, and instead were likely items discarded near the closing of the camp after trash pickup was suspended 
in some of the adjacent barracks blocks. Many of these artifacts spoke about daily life, material consumption in Amache. Clothing hangers and lampshades tell a story about decorating the interior of barracks and creating a livable environment. Small food and condiment jars connected to stories about the mess hall food and attempts to cook in the residential units. Toiletry containers, like cold cream jars, indicate Amachian's attempts to battle the dry climate. But some items identified during survey were likely related to sports and other uses of this block, like the celebration of Obon. We wonder if this hand-carved geta found in the block might not have seen its last Obon just before Amache closed. On the northeast side of the block, surveyors noticed a distinct rise that was accompanied by wire fencing. Based on the layout of the field and historic images, we determined that this was the remains of the baseball backstop. Here you can see crowds of people gathered on the rise near the backstop watching a sporting event. The archaeology of the block is showing how it was used as a sports field, but also indicating that it had other uses for the community as a gathering and activity space. So based on historic images, maps, and people's memories, we know that Amachi had two sumo rings. One was located in the center of town in a public space and the other in a residential block. Sumo was a popular sport and a number of young boys participated and learned the sport of Amachi. During the 2014 field school, we surveyed 9F, a block that contained one of the two sumo rings. This sumo ring was the largest and constructed near the consumer co-op at the center of the site. Its central position near the baseball diamond and football field indicate the importance of this sport for residents at Amachi. By placing the field centrally near other important buildings and communal spaces, they made it easier to access and also more visible. Initially, we conducted a pedestrian survey, so a walk in the area to see if any remains of the sumo ring might be visible. The survey team was pretty excited to identify a flat area carved out of the rolling sandy hills of Block 9F in the corner where oral history had suggested we might find the feature. Since then, we've actually gone back and used drone data, so taken aerial photography, to confirm our on-the-ground findings. Both the aerial photographs and elevation data derived from them clearly show this raised ring and how it stands out from the natural topography. And you can really see it. It's a circular feature in the images on the right-hand side. Combining multiple archaeological technologies confirms our findings and is adding nuance. In this case, it supported our identification of the ring's location, and it also showed the effort that would have been expended in its construction to raise and flatten areas of the landscape. Our final example comes from a study of one of the barracks blocks that you see in the map here on the left. Uh, our work in the barracks blocks helps us really understand daily life in the camp, and especially the way Amachians uh, used and changed their immediate surroundings. Um, block 12H was a typical residential block located in the south end of Amachi, and like all the other blocks, it has a standardized layout with two rows of barracks containing the living units, and as well as a recreation hall, uh, and in the center part were communal facilities. So the H-shaped feature that you see there uh, is the foundation for the combination bathhouse, latrine, and uh, and laundry facilities, and then uh, the uh, more rectangular feature north of them was where the mess hall was. So this block was first surveyed in 2010, and we found a number of garden features, and these are the ones that you see uh, on the map in outlined in purple. Uh, that year we chose to uh, do test excavations in the one marked F3, that's feature three. Uh, it's an entryway garden. And uh, we do excavations because they allow us to study uh, what has been covered by the soil that's been blown in since the camp was closed, and also to collect a, the fine, kind of fine-grained data that is otherwise inaccessible. And this garden is a really good example. So uh, we identified two planters um, that you can see in that picture that were actually made of broken water pipe that had been set up and placed down into the ground um, as a sort of looks pretty much like a plant pot you might buy. Um, and so when we excavated within those planters and then in the soil around them, something that we found was very finely crumbled eggshell. Uh, eggshell is a good example of the kind of soil amendments that Amachians were adding to their gardens to make the really sandy and poor soil of the camp uh, be more productive for growing things. 
Uh, and so this kind of study of the camp landscape has been one of my primary research um, goals at the site. And uh, if you are interested in a little learning a little bit more about the archaeology of Amachi's gardens, I would encourage you to go back to the Tadaima website and look at um, the programming for week one. And so on Tuesday, I presented, of uh, that first week, I presented uh, about uh, the archaeology of Amachi's gardens and gardeners. So these uh, excavations that we did uh, in this garden in block 12H are pretty typical of many of them that we've done and that have been really sort of focused on better understanding how incarceries um, uh, modified um, the landscape and used their skills um, in doing so. Uh, but another big area of our work has been in anticipation of, pro of projects that are going to uh, potentially impact um, archaeological remains. And so our work in 2010 had shown us that this block uh, had good physical integrity and had at least some buried uh, deposits. And so in um, 2012, we came back to the block uh, before this, um, the reconstructed barrack and uh, guard tower that you see here, before they were put in place, we did archaeology um, in those areas. And then we returned again in 2014 when there was um, a talk of bringing back a latrine uh, into that area. So before that happened, uh, we tried to do archaeological clearance. And one of our main tools for doing that is ground penetrating radar. And that is the instrument that you see here with my crews um, working on. And uh, it is a way to, for, to help us, it uses energy pulses to sort of see below the ground in a way that's a lot like sonar. So the energy goes down into the ground and if it hits something different, it bounces back up and it records it. Uh, and so uh, what we are able to see with that are things like buried um, surfaces that are compacted or are somehow different, uh, buried uh, things like walls or foundations, um, as well as uh, concentrations of artifacts. And so when we did ground penetrating radar near the latrine in, um, in this block, uh, we found this uh, phenomenon that you see in the graphic up at the top. So the, the very thick layers of the dark and the light together tell us that there's some kind of a, a surface there that's different from the soil that surrounds it. And so what we do is when we lay out the ground penetrating radar, we actually set it up on a grid so that it's easy for us to map and we know where that happens. We use that same grid then on our test excavations and we carefully lay them out and string them out. You can see in the picture down below, um, we uh, carefully document what's on the surface. And then as we move down and, and slowly peel back layer after layer. We are taking photographs, we are taking notes, as you can see here, we're taking measurements because we are disturbing these layers and we wanna make sure that we collect all the information we can while we are doing that. Um, so as we're removing the soil, we are taking it and carefully sifting it and looking for um, artifacts uh, that have been, um, were deposited there when people were living at Amachi. Uh, and then in the gardens, we're also taking uh, soil chemistry and other samples to be able to recover uh, botanical uh, data. And so when we did an excavation in this area of the GPR feature, and that's the excavation you see there, uh, we uncovered this very compact surface. And it goes back to what April was talking about earlier with the basketball, that essentially we, that there were just lots and lots of feet um, uh, compact compacting the surface. And in addition to finding that compacted surface, we also found a big piece of, of, of wood there. Now we find wood in gardens, but we don't find those compacted um, layers. And so we thought about what those two different phenomena together might be um, implying. And knowing that the central part of these blocks were often used for sports, we thought, well, we wondered if this wasn't a baseball, the edge of a baseball diamond and a, and that the wood was a backstop. And so um, we were about to find out that that was actually a very good hypothesis. So one of the key components of our field school and one of the parts that we enjoy the most 
is uh, our series of community open houses. And we invite members of the uh, survivor and descendant community, as well as the local community to come out to the site and see what we're doing. Um, these uh, visits often um, spur memories and they start important discussions that uh, drive our interpretations and our research plans. And during the 2014 Community Open House, uh, visitors uh, came to this area and included um, a man who had lived in this block. And before we could even tell him our hypothesis of what we had excavated there, he pointed to right near where that unit was and said, that's where our baseball field was. And my crew was just absolutely ecstatic that um, he that we had uh, that we'd come up with a good idea for how that um, area of the block had been used, and we were so pleased to hear more about the stories of of life um, in that block from our visitors. Uh, with this new information, then we returned back to that third strand that we use when we do this research, which is our archival data, with new eyes, as we often do after we've been in the field and talk to people. And so we looked at this overview from the camp, um, and we noticed uh, not one, but probably two baseball backstops. So the one that's closest to you in this image is actually from the block that's adjacent, but because the picture is a little closer, we can see a little more details of that baseball backstop. Uh, but then the, the one in the background, that is actually the area where we excavated. And in a, a kind of quick view of this earlier on, I thought that maybe that had been a, like a garden wall, but in combination with uh, the oral history, we now know that what that image is, is our baseball backstop that we um, recovered. And this is a really good example of the way that um, our work combines archival, archaeological, and community data um, and brings them together to capture an important part of life at Amachi and also to be able to better interpret and to preserve these important remains. Each of the three sports fields we've talked about here were part of a complex network of teams and players, fields, they were constructed across Amachi, and they became a mechanism for coping with the injustices of forced incarceration. So one of our former intern, field school interns, Ricky Ajima, noted in her senior thesis that sports like baseball actually help facilitate resiliency among incarcerees. As anthropologists, we see many aspects of life within the incarceration centers represented in the activity of sport. So you can see the complex negotiations that were occurring between administrators and internees in the continuation of Japanese sports and in the development of internee-run recreation associations. Uh, acts of placemaking are visible in the construction of sumo rings and fields in residential blocks as internees made space for important community activities and also used existing space like the TANF sports fields to host festivals and large community events. The continuation and creation of community is seen in new teams as they're forming and earlier teams reforming within the incarceration center. We also see the role of sports in creating a sense of communal identity in newspaper articles covering games and in the crowds of spectators that gathered to cheer and support their friends and families. Sports teams came and went as team members left for employment outside of the center or relocated permanently reflecting the ebb and flow of Amachi's population. Archaeologically, all of these threads or components of the experience of being incarcerated become tangible when we blend the physical evidence of sports that remain at Amachi today with archival documents and personal accounts. At Amachi and other incarceration centers, sports acted as a venue to connect residents through a shared social activity. It helped them retain existing friendships, create new ones, and acted as a means to connect to places beyond the barbed wire. In conclusion, we really want to thank Tadema for organizing this digital, digital pilgrimage, which has provided us a venue for sharing our research and interacting with all of you and all of the people who we normally get to see during the field school. We also want to thank members of the Amache community for all of their contributions to our project. Without their work, information, and help, none of this would really have been popular, possible or popular. Um, and if you want to learn more about this project, you should visit our website, uh, which is portfolio.du.edu backslash Amachi, and the link to it is right there on the slide. Uh, there's more information on all of the different projects and research that we've been doing, 
Um, soon there'll be a link both to Bonnie's presentation on the gardens, but also the research that I've been doing on sports and social networks as part of my dissertation research. So keep an eye on this space. It's an always evolving area where we share the research and work that we're doing for the community. So thank you all for joining us and uh, we hope you've enjoyed this presentation. <laughs>